Okay, so welcome everyone and welcome Lake and Ungrady. Oh my, I forgot that it's <laughs> Wednesday in uh, in the um, Midwest. So we're just as we're getting started, they're doing a testing of the siren system, but that'll end in just a second, uh, if you can hear that or not. Um, so hi, I am, uh, I'm Lake Matheson. I am excited and um, uh, I think it's gonna be an interesting conversation. And I hope that it is. I hope that it's more of a conversation. Uh, I have a, a number of things that I can talk about um, and uh, kind of go through my experience and what I've learned, what I've liked about the change that I've made and what I still feel unsatisfied with. But um, I do want to save plenty of time in our 90 minutes to ask questions, to have conversations. If there's anyone else out there that has tried uh, ungrading or is currently ungrading, that's you know wants to to contribute their own perspectives that would be great too i don't want it to to be just kind of me talking at at everyone like like i am the the be all and all of knowledge in uh ungrading in the world language i am simply a person who has uh, very much resonated with the arguments that i've read and and kind of decided to to jump in and so that's why I call the presentation a leap of faith, because that's absolutely what I think that it is, that there's always going to be lots of, oh, what ifs, and if I do this, then the students will that, and, and um, fears about moving away from traditional grading. And so at some point, you kind of just have to say, I'm going to try it and see what happens. Um, kind of before I get started, I'm curious of the people that are are uh, here. Who is um, more from elementary level, from middle school level, from high school level, or from um, higher ed? If you can type in the chat just so I can sort of see. All right, a few higher ed, high school, middle school, middle school. Okay, so a good mix. So some of the things that I'm saying are probably not going to apply as much in higher ed contexts. And then uh, some of the things wouldn't apply as much in um, like elementary school context. So to kind of feel free to take or leave whatever, you know, whatever doesn't feel applicable to you. When I talk about classroom management and, um, you know, potential pushback from students in behaviors and things like that, and how we use, how often we've been using grades sort of as a, as a tool of classroom management, that's not going to be as relevant for uh, like a higher ed context because that's, that's just not the expectation of behavior uh, of that age and um, group of students. But, you know, it's still, it still might be possible depending on where, uh, you know, everyone's student body is different. All right. Quite a few higher ed, quite a few high school. Okay, good, good to know. All right, so our agenda. You're gonna notice that aside from the beautifully put together um, cover slide that my, uh, my presentation is minimalist and I am a minimalist in my life as I am in my grades. So I hope that you don't mind that it's not um, a bunch of flashy graphics. So the agenda for today, what do I kind of want to talk about before we have the opportunity to um, kind of get into a conversation? So I'm going to talk about my path to ungrading. Not necessarily because um, I think it's the path. I just think that I have run the gamut as far as grading goes. And so if I can explain my path and you can identify yourself anywhere on that path, then you can see that there's kind of a next step to take. And then, uh, so basically what is ungrading? Um, someone said they can't see the slides. Is that the case for everybody? Um, I can see your slides. Hmm. Yeah, we, I don't know, Sylvia, I'm sorry. I don't know why you can. Uh, yeah, we see them. We see them like you can, you can keep going. Okay. Let me pull the chat back up. Okay. So what is ungrading? That's going to be sort of 
a brief definition and then I'm having fun with my languaging here. Why is ungrading kind of what's the what's the basis? Why why is ungrading something that we would be interesting interested in doing? And of course the how. So the what, the why, and the how, um, which is sort of built into uh, the why and the what. But I'll get a little bit more specific in the how part as to if you don't feel like you're ready to completely revamp everything, what are some beginner level steps and what are some intermediate level steps? Some common concerns, because there are lots. There are lots and lots of things that uh, make people nervous about the idea of ungrading and some of the precursors to it. Um, actually, I'm gonna ask another question before I keep going. Who in uh, who of the listeners is familiar with or has read or understands like the, the arguments in grading for equity? So things like um, eliminating zeros, having minimal like floor of floor grades, um, not grading practice, things like that. Who, who's familiar with grading for equity as a book or as an idea? All right. Okay, familiar with the book? Have it, but haven't read it. All right, so for anyone that's not really familiar, like you've heard of it, but you haven't necessarily dived in, I'm going to cover a little bit of that because I think it's relevant, um, relevant on kind of the path towards, towards ungrading. So good to know that there are, that I won't just be preaching kind of to the choir, that there are people who aren't, who aren't familiar. And then finally, uh, question and answer where we can hopefully address any additional concerns that I haven't kind of predicted. Okay, so my path to ungrading <laughs> with my uh, curved line. So when I started out teaching, it was a, in a higher ed context and it was as a TA in graduate school. So I started with a traditional grade book because it was given to us, our syllabus uh, divided up into tests, into quizzes, into participation, into discussion boards, homework, essays, like basically all of the things you could possibly do in a semester, each one had a line in a grade book and it was given a percentage. And that seemed very normal. That was how I was graded in college. And so that's how I, that's what I did as long as I um, was working at that, at that college level. Uh, after I graduated, I taught online for a while. So then when I was designing my own, um, my own grade scales, I did the same thing because that's what, what I knew. And then I uh, moved from higher ed to teaching at the secondary level. So right now I teach uh, nine through 12 grade Spanish, all of the levels, um, concurrent enrollment uh, at a very rural high school in central Minnesota. And that district uh, has something interesting that rather than leave it totally up to the teacher's discretion and rather than prescribe it very specifically, because I've seen and I've read examples of both teachers in districts that do both. Um, they have a maximum percentage for practice. So 80% of the grade should be for mastery, which I interpret as tests and projects. And then 20% for practice. And that's that's the maximum it could be. And I asked when, when they were talking about this, uh, you know, does it, 20% the minimum? Is it the maximum? Is it have to be 20%? He said, no, 20% it, it, is the maximum. And so that's what I did my first year there. I did 80-20 and I, my 20% was, um, I didn't do a whole lot of homework. At that point, I was already sort of converted to the idea that at least in high school, this is where the higher ed kind of is different. Higher ed does not have nearly the seat time to not assign homework. At the high school level, we have a decent amount of seat time to be able to focus the interaction in class and not expect uh, the students to be doing a lot of homework. But I had things like Duolingo and other practice assignments, uh, videos, ed puzzles, things that I wanted them to do. And that all went in practice. And then one summer, I read the intro chapter to Grading for Equity, which is available for free online. And that summer I had been thinking, oh, you know, I might switch to 9010 um, because I didn't really like what I was seeing, what was what was happening to the students' grades as I was putting in those practice points. Some people were 
artificially being lowered, like their grade, their ultimate letter grade was being lowered by the fact that they weren't doing those practice assignments, but they were in, able to interact otherwise in class. And some students' grades were being artificially um, increased by inc including that stuff that they were doing the points. So they were getting that, uh, that those percentages in the gradebook. But uh, but their interaction in class wasn't really improving because of it. So I read Grading for Equity that summer and, and switched. I said, OK, I don't need to do any. I don't need to have 10% practice. I'm going to go 100% mastery. So the Grading for Equity uh, advocates that the grade should reflect what the students can do and shouldn't be artificially lowered or increased um, because of behaviors, things like uh, homework completion. So I went 100% mastery, which was an interesting switch because I had students, I don't think they noticed for a while because I continued to put it in the grade book. I just didn't have it, uh, it was 0%. So it didn't impact the grade and a lot of them just didn't notice, which was fine. I did not draw their attention to that. I did not want to encourage them to say, oh, it doesn't count, I don't need to do it. <laughs> But a lot of them continued to do it. I would say the same students who did it before uh, continued to do it, even though uh, it no longer counted in the gradebook. Um, so I moved to that. And then to sort of a riff on standards-based grading. My school does not standards-based grade. Uh, people in the middle school and high school level are likely to be more familiar with what standards-based grading is, um, perhaps than people in, in higher ed. So standards-based grading, at least how it was given to me. I was given some books to read over the summer. And basically it said, find your standards, the standards that um, like the state is telling you or the, or the national level, level standards. Find the ones that you prioritized, break them up into uh, proficiency scales of at maximum four or five levels. And then each of those levels um, has a number. So, you know, one, two, three, four, or one, two, three, four, five. And each of those levels corresponds to, you know, you're at the target, you're exceeding the target, you're approaching the target, you're not quite yet approaching the target. So sort of um, more of a, a targeted area than a specific number that you'd be uh, earning on a particular assessment. And so I moved into something like that. I redeveloped my assessments with standards-based grading in mind so that I was no longer um, doing anything kind of discrete points. I wasn't asking, you know, here's a 10 point multiple choice and then a short answer period. I was uh, designing my assessments so that there was a section where I was, you know, targeting word understanding because that's kind of at a, you know, individual words and then sort of main ideas. Can you paraphrase what's happening in, uh, in this reading or in this thing that you listen to? Are you getting main ideas? Or are you getting specific details? Can you translate specific um, things? So that was kind of how my, my proficiency skills worked. And then last summer, I uh, finally went out and I bought, um, bought the books. I bought on grading. I bought um, grading for equity. So I read more than just the first chapter. And I read them over the summer and I said, I'm all in. So I don't call what I do on grading, I think that's kind of a, it's more of a philosophical term than I think it is a useful term to use with the students or with parents. What I tell my students, what I tell their parents, since it's at the high school level, is I do feedback only, no scores. That's all, that's what I tell them, is that I'm going to give you feedback on how you're doing, but I'm not going to assign you a number. I'm not going to give you a test and then say you've got 10 out of 10. Um, so what I do isn't exactly taking away grades, but taking away scores. Because at the end of the semester, they still have to get a letter grade. And then we'll talk about kind of how, how to come to that letter. All right, so I started out very traditional divisions for everything in the grade book. Then I switched to this idea where there's only two divisions, one's mastery and one is practice, or you could do, I don't know, tests and quizzes or tests and homework or whatever. And, and then I switched and I got rid of that other category entirely. So everything that my students are evaluated on is, is they're showing me um, what they can do with the Spanish and sort of a standards-based grading system where um, they're, they're evaluated on, on general levels of, of their proficiency. 
And now I don't even give them points for those, uh, for those assessments. It's only feedback with no scores. Okay, so in a general sense, what is ungrading? First, we kind of have to talk about what is grading. Like what, what does it mean to grade? We use the word grade to talk about a lot of different things. We talk about um, the grade on a particular homework assignment or the grade on a particular test, uh, or we talk about the grade at the end of the semester, the end of the year, the end of the term. So grading is kind of all of those things. And we often use grading when what we mean is scores, which is why I say I do no scores um, when I talk to students and parents. So grading is oftentimes used to talk about grades on a specific assignments, grades on specific tests. So ungrading isn't necessarily no grade at the end of the semester, though there are people that would advocate for that, advocate for doing only pass fail, which I don't think my school would let me do. So I don't, I'm not exploring that area or uh, giving everybody A's. That is something I've read as, as a, uh, an avenue into ungrading. It's not something I would choose to do because my, in my opinion, if, if we think that the system of grading is broken, I would rather do what I can to help it rather than to break it worse. I think giving everyone an A admits that it's totally broken, that grades are absolutely useless. And, um, and I can see the arguments of the people who say that, but that's not an argument that I would make. Um, I think another question we want to ask is what's the point of a grade? What should a grade represent and what does it often represent? So in my opinion, hopefully uh, you would share this opinion. The point of a grade should be to demonstrate learning. It should be to demonstrate what a student can do. It shouldn't demonstrate um, punctuality, things like behavior, um, whether they were respectful in the classroom, as much as I want them to be respectful in the classroom, I don't think their grade should reflect that. I think their grade should reflect what can they do? What can they understand? How much can they communicate in Spanish in my case, obviously? Uh, what does it often represent? I think it often represents a lot of extraneous things. I have read, I have not actually um, encountered someone, but I have read of examples of teachers giving extra credit for, for bringing in canned goods, bringing in Kleenex, teachers taking off points for students not wearing their uniform. And all of those things mean that the grade doesn't really represent what the student can do. It's, it's representing all sorts of additional stuff. So in my opinion, the grade should reflect what the student can do, what do they understand? What can they communicate? And so then ungrading, my definition, is that it removes the barriers. What grades do is they draw attention from students learning and they pay, put the attention on the grade, right? We want our students to think about their learning. Giving them grades is actually taking their attention away from what they're learning and it's putting it on a number or a letter and it's externally focusing uh, their attention. And I want their attention on their learning and I want my attention on their learning. So ungrading is recognizing that there's a problem with the grading system and then it's removing those barriers, right? Grades are creating barriers to students' attention. And so ungrading is taking those barriers away. So why? I've already kind of alluded in a number of ways to why is it that I think uh, ungrading is worth exploring, worth moving towards. So grades are damaging. Grades are not um, a positive, and they're, we're like fish, I think, in a lot of senses, in that we can't see the water because we're swimming in it. And we swim in this in this water of grades. And so we don't realize that that is something that has been um, externally put upon us. And there are all sorts of books and, uh, and chapters and things that explain the history of grades and how they were created and, and 
why it is that we think the grades are so integral to learning when the history of that would indicate otherwise. So what are some of the ways in which grades are damaging? They're coercive. So if you're using grades to punish students for turning in late work, if you're using grades to try to teach students a lesson about being responsible and getting their work in on time and studying for their tests and, and other things like if you're using extra credit for things that have nothing to do with the learning, um, that's, that's coercion. That's using a grade as a tool to force a student to behave in a particular way but it's not uh, reflecting necessarily their learning. It's, and now I feel like I'm being negative and if there are people in the, uh, that are listening that, are, that feel attacked, I'm gonna pause for a second and, I, and I'm gonna flatly say, we do all of this with the best intentions, right? Um, anything that we're doing, we're doing it because we think that the students need it and that it's helpful. Part of my leap of faith was coming to the understanding that I don't think that's the case. And I get, <laughs> I get a little emotional about it, but. Um, I've had a real change of heart about grading practices and wanting to be able to communicate that to people in a way that doesn't feel attacking, but feels welcoming. So uh, I just want to put that out there. Grades. Um, are currently often used as a tool for control rather than to reflect. Grades are demotivating. And now maybe there are people who are out there thinking, yes, they are. I, I'm, a, I'm a cone head, referring to LFE cone. Uh, grades are demotivating. And then some other people might be thinking, what do you mean grades are demotivating? Mo grades are the only thing that motivates my students. In which case I would say, motivating them to what? Motivating them to learn or motivating them to get a grade. And those are different things. You may end up learning something kind of incidentally while you're focused on the grade, but that's not the same thing as being motivated to learn, right? We've got extrinsic and we've got intrinsic motivation. Grades are an extrinsic motivator and extrinsic motivators damage intrinsic motivation. So grades are pulling attention and they are focusing students on the wrong thing. The thing they should be focusing on is their learning. And when they're focusing on, oh, well, you know, ugh, I really studied super hard and I only got an 89, I didn't get an A. They're not paying attention to all that they learned. They're paying attention to what they didn't, to the part that fell short, um, which is, some would say, oh, well, you know, then they'll study harder next time. Or, or maybe they'll internalize that they're not good enough and then they'll try less, right? So if we don't give students a, a more concrete path forward, then grades are just, they're giving them this kind of false information that isn't particularly helpful, it's just judgmental. What else about grades? They're misleading. So if you are, if you're getting extra credit points because you're bringing in Kleenex or you're bringing in canned goods for the food drive, your grade is not an accurate reflection of your learning. Um, there's a false sense of objectivity. And this goes back to a lot of the grading for equity. So the idea that a 100 point system, um, you know, when we have uh, 100 point percentages, the idea that we have is that, oh, that's really objective because it's a number and then look, there's decimal points, but it's a false sense of objectivity because what's to say that a 97.2 is different than a 97.3 or that an 89.9 is different than a 90.1. Uh, and they are easily and often manipulated, manipulated up, manipulated down so that they're not actually reflecting what the student can do in a broader sense. They're reflecting behavior, like I said, with homework and late penalties and um, and yeah, other things in, in those areas that 
we use them and manipulate them to get students to do different things. And believe me, I still want students to do those things. I still want students to be respectful, to behave, to develop a good work ethic, to, um, to what else, to be responsible. Uh, but I think behavior consequences for behavior problems, right? Not grade consequences for behavior problems. Okay, so how? How do we ungrade? Where, where can we move into ungrading? And here's where I'm gonna talk a little bit more about grading for equity. If we ungrade, right? If we take away the things that are, if we stop giving points to things, right? We still maybe have to give a letter grade, but you stop giving points to things that don't need points. You are unburdening yourself. Don't think about what are you, what do you have to give up? Think of it as you are unpacking this heavy load that we have, we, we are doing all of these things with grades that is burdening us and, and we, can, we can undo those things. So zeros, people feel so much conflict over zeros because I've been reading all sorts of conversations. Ed Utopia had, a, had an article recently about um, removing zeros and there were hundreds of comments and a lot of deeply held feelings about fairness and how if we don't give kids zeros for not turning in work, it's not fair to the student that does poorly but tries, which again, we're using the grade as a tool and not to reflect. Um, that we're, we're giving kids the idea that they don't need to do the work and there won't be consequences. And the use of consequence language belies that we're not using the grade anymore to reflect, right? We're using it um, to control. So zeros, 100 point scales in general. Um, if you've read Grading for Equity, you're familiar with the idea that 90 to 100 is an A, 80 to 90 is a B, 70 to 80 is a C, uh, 60 to 70 is a D, and then zero to 50 is an F or however it is that particular schools or departments um, might break it down. But still, the idea of failure taking up as much combined points as, as all of the rest of the possible letters. And I resonate very much with this argument is mathematically nonsensical. It just doesn't make sense. And the idea that, oh, well, you know, if I'm gonna grade this on a rubric, am I gonna give this a 96 or a 97? And if I give it a 96, is that student gonna argue for that one more point? Unburden yourself from the idea of having to uh, justify one point increments or even half point increments, quarter point increments, like we get so specific. Oh, but my grade is a 91.97. Can I just have the 92 so that I can have an A and seven A minus? Unburden yourself. Ungrading unburdens yourself from those conversations. Okay, late penalties, which we already talked about. Late penalties, also very up in the feelings with a lot of teachers. If I don't penalize them for being late, when they go to work, they're gonna turn things in late and they're gonna get fired. Like we get very, um, very emotional about the idea of we need to teach them by punishing them when they're late. And I would argue a behavior punishment is going to work a lot better than a grade punishment. And that's hard at the higher ed level. I'm gonna stop right now and just say, that's tricky because there's no, there isn't really a behavior punishment that exists. <laughs> at the high school and the secondary level, we can say, you need to come in during your lunch because you didn't finish this, this assignment. Um, and I don't have all of the answers on that. I would love to think through some options. Uh, I understand that that's a particular issue to say that that, um, that that you should use a behavior penalty, but at the college level, by that point, the behavior penalty might be they don't get the feedback, right? If they turn it in late, they don't get the feedback, and then that's a natural consequence because they're not going to be able to do better on, on the next assignment, for example. Okay, practice points, which I already talked about. Um, so giving points for homework grading homework, having to put in scores for homework, unburden yourself, just like, ah, let it go. It, those practice points are only making the grade uh, misleading. They're either bringing it up or they're bringing it down. 
And if they're not doing either, then they're not necessary. If their practice points are exactly the same as how they're testing, then what's the point? Just don't, just don't. Just give the test scores. If they're all equal, then, then you don't need them. Participation grades, ah, language teachers. We love our participation grade, don't we? We think, how are the students going to participate if we don't make them? So again, we're using grades as a tool to coerce. And I understand the, in, the impulse. I'm not saying it's not uh, a valid impulse. It's an impulse that I have. I'll admit to still having, but then I have to recognize it in myself and say, that's not, that's not what the grade is. Yes, does participating in, in a language class make them more likely to um, feel more confident and to do better in, in future assessments? Sure. I will grant that. So the natural consequence is, is if you don't participate, you don't do as well. You're already not doing as well or you're doing better on the thing that should count, which is the assessment. And the same thing with practice points. If you don't turn in homework and therefore don't do as well on the test, that's your consequence, right? If you do poorly on the test and you are getting um, zero points from the homework, you're really being penalized twice. Is, is being penalized once not enough? So participation and practice, both of those things, just don't worry about it. Participation grading is exhausting. How do I, how do I track it? What do I do if the students are really um, introverts? And how do I be equitable to the introverts and not punish them for being introverted? Unburden yourself, just, just don't, just don't. Don't grade participation. And I know you might be thinking, I, I couldn't possibly. They'll stop participating and I'll just be talking the whole hour. Try it and see what happens. Okay, averaging and weighting. This one's tough, right? We take a test at the beginning of the semester and we take a test in the middle and we take a test in the end and then we average. But don't we expect students to do better at the end than they would at the beginning? So why are we dragging them down? And if a student um, does really well at the beginning of the semester and then something happens and they totally flake and they whatever happens in their life and they stop participating, that doesn't necessarily mean that um, that wherever they wherever they end up should be higher because they did so much better at the beginning, right? They should end up wherever they end up at the end of the semester, whatever is most recent. That's another um, argument from uh, from grading for equity. So against averaging, against weighting, and if you only have one category, then you don't have to worry about weighting anyway. Um, although in in languages, you can decide you know how you want to break down your emphasis on whether you want to do interpersonal, presentational, and interpretive. I choose to do skills, listening, reading, writing, speaking. Um, and then if you want to have students and yourself put more emphasis on one than the other, that's fine. But I don't think there's any, there's no reason to say that however you did at the beginning of the semester weighs into how you're doing at the end of the semester. And then extra credit, which I mentioned for the Kleenexes and the, and those are silly examples, right? I hope that we can all agree that bringing Kleenexes doesn't reflect on your grade. But, and I recognize, especially in higher ed, we like extra credit because we get to tell students to go to stuff, go to conferences, go to talks, um, attend cultural events. How on earth will we get them to go to those events if we don't? give them extra credit. And my reflection on that is, are they actually more likely to do it because of the extra credit? Or would those same students do it just because the teacher said, this is going to be a really cool event. I encourage you to go see it. And you know, is it possible that we could motivate them intrinsically rather than extrinsically? And the students that do go to events and don't, you know, they, they get some exposure and whatever, but they don't actually learn any more target language. Is it really fair that their grade changes 
because they went to a talk versus the students that can communicate in Spanish? I would argue that that doesn't make sense. Okay, so I've said a lot. Let's see um, kind of how ungrading can work with the very babyest of steps. If you're watching this and you're not sure whether you're all in for ungrading, sounds interesting, but uh, I don't really know how I would start. My life is too complicated as it is. Here are a few baby steps. Just start by adjusting your language. Adjust your mindset towards grades. Adjust your mindset towards students. Stop referring to the things that students got wrong and focus on what they've learned. So students, and it's not just your language, right? Make a conscious adjustment to the way that you and students talk about their learning. So if you hear students ask, oh, what'd you get on the last test? Or what did I get on the test? Switch that from, well, what did you learn? What could you do, right? Don't focus on the number or the letter, which is an artificial and completely arbitrary uh, definition of, of learning and, and get more into, well, what were you able to do on the last test? How, did, how do you think it went for you? Not what grade, not what number, not what letter. So that's, that's the most basic. Here's something super simple. Take the numbers out of your rubrics. If you have rubrics and they already have labels and they already have a clear progression from um, not really fulfilling the requirements to requirements and how, take the numbers out. Give your students feedback only on how they're doing and just don't have them, don't give them that number to be like, oh, well, I got an eight out of 10 on this section and I got a nine out of 10 on this section, but I only got a five out of 10 on this section. So my ultimate, like take, try to keep them from making those calculations because those calculations are what? They are drawing their attention from the learning. They're not thinking about how they did. They're thinking about what they got. So the more we can take those numbers out, the more we can let their brains continue to focus on, on, um, on, on the learning, on what they did. Delay the grade. I mean, I credit the cult of, the cult of pedagogy blog um, for this one. And actually I should, I didn't write it up there, but the adjusting the language, that's very much a star sexteen comment. Hacking assessment. I, mean, I have a bunch of, I have a slide of, of resources. So hacking assessment, that was one of, um, one of her first hacks, right? is to help change the language. So delay the grade. What is delay the grade? Delay the grade is, for example, if students submit an essay or take some kind of test. See, my, my assessments and your assessments are probably gonna be different, but uh, however you could imagine working this. The hard part is if your assessments are discrete, like multiple choice, because it's gonna be pretty easy for them to see the number of items that they got right versus wrong and then just add the math themselves. But if it's something with, that's a little bit more, um, a little bit more subjective, so like an essay, give them feedback and don't give them a grade. That doesn't necessarily mean you don't have a grade for them, but you don't tell them what it is. And then what they should do is react to the feedback and ideally uh, make changes, right? They should do a second draft or do a second something, do something to react to the feedback and take it, right? Because feedback is not particularly useful if it's not taken, if it's not applied. So give them the feedback, the grades off to the side, ask them how they think, that given your feedback, how do they think they did? How would they grade themselves? What changes would they make? Ask them to, make those to apply that feedback. Uh, and then maybe you change, change the grade, right? If they, if they apply the feedback well, then you can change it. But at the end, then give them the score. Uh, or maybe you'll just discover that you don't need to give them the score at all because they've, they've applied the feedback and they've increased their learning. But delaying the grade is something that should be imminently applicable and, and doable for anyone, right? I've got the feedback, I've got a grade, I'm just gonna hide the grade for right now. And I'm gonna give the students the feedback. Let's work with the feedback and then afterwards give the grade. Okay, medium steps. If you're on board with those things, you wanna do more. If you can't go completely gradeless, grade less. 
So take out, I mean, don't necessarily stop giving homework, especially if you're in higher ed, there's just not enough seat time. Um, I don't do very much in the way of homework, but, uh, but it's you know we always want our students to interact more with the language that's how they grow so i'm not saying don't give them those opportunities and give them those suggestions for things that they can do outside of class but it doesn't need to be in the gradebook if it's better if if doing it increases their uh, grade without increasing their ability then it's artificially inflating if not doing it artificially decreases their their grade then it's still artificial and if it's exactly the same then then putting it in the grade book is pointless um, stop giving extra credit i've already talked about um, that so we've talked so this is just kind of find ways to not score things that you are currently scoring do not give points for your things you're currently giving points for right so the medium steps kind of go back to uh, these doo -doo -doo -doo, these areas, right, from the grading for equity. Now, here's the issue that I have anyway. I think the medium steps are harder. The baby steps are baby, that's fine. You don't really have to make very much in the way of changes to do baby steps. But I honestly think that doing a, the medium step is harder than just going all the way because we, tie our brains in knots trying to justify what does it mean to do a 50% floor? So if a student doesn't turn in an assignment, I have to give them a 50%, like so schools will say, you know, do this. We have a 50% floor as a district. You can't give a zero, you can only give a 50%. And that's for the mathematical reason that 50 to 60 makes it the same um, percentage as all the rest of the letters. So mathematically, it makes sense, but oh, does it not feel fair? It doesn't feel right. And so we twist ourselves in knots over a lot of those. Um, Blake, can you hear me? Maybe she's lost. lost. Lake, Lake. Um, um, somehow it. This meeting is being recorded. Okay, now it's saying it's recording again, sorry. Okay, anyway, all out overhaul, where was I? Okay, how do you start? Where do you start with ungrading? You have to have standards, <laughs> right? And, and by standards, I mean, um, you know, what do you expect students to be able to do by the end of the term? And here's where I feel like ungrading makes more sense than standards-based grading. When I uh, made my standards-based scales, I could not do scales the same way that the examples were in the book because the book standards were things like science and math, English, where uh, they have, you know, standard 2.1 of the of some American history is can explain, you know, the First Amendment and can compare it to whatever. So that's very content-based. Uh, whereas in in languages, we don't really have a standard one can talk about the family standard two can talk about the house standard three can talk about the city textbooks may be organized that way but that's not really how standards at least the ones i've seen uh, are laid out they're more like can communicate using words can communicate using sentences can create new sentences can create paragraphs um and so lining laying that out in a proficiency scale was was a challenge because it was it just didn't look like the examples I was reading. So for me, like I said, my standards are speaking, listening, writing, reading. I also add culture in there because I'm I'm trying to uh, deliberately incorporate more culture uh, into my classes rather than just focusing on what are the words and how can we you know put them in a new order. Um, you could you could do the interpersonal, presentational, and interpretive. I choose not to do that. If anyone's curious what my justification is for that, I could say, but I don't need to get into that. So once you have your standards, right? 
then you want to create a proficiency scale or a learning progression. So learning progression is where I am in my process of change right now. Where did my book go? Here it is. So this summer, because I'm constantly learning, this summer I read well, Going Gradeless. Going Gradeless is written by two science teachers, primarily physics. Um, but I really like the way that they describe learning progressions. So a learning progression is very much like what I had already done to adapt proficiency to a proficiency scale, right? And proficiency scale does not mean the same, doesn't, isn't using the word proficiency in the same way that in languages we use proficiency, uh, which can be kind of confusing. But the learning progression is basically, you know, at the very least, you, you find some kind of on-ramp for a student. What does a student who is trying to do anything at all, what does that look like? And then what's the next step? What's the next step they could do to increase the complexity of their output? Or what is the next logical thing they could understand? If they could start out understanding individual words from something they're hearing, which is a novice, um, novice low, novice mid skill, depending on the, the resource. And they can move from, oh, I understood that that was about uh, a boy talking about his family. That's a main idea, right? So that's not just understanding, oh, I, I heard the word familia in there somewhere. Oh, I got the, the main idea. Oh, I heard that he said his sister uh, goes to college right now that we're talking about some specific details. So that learning progression um, gives students somewhere that they can identify that they are, and then it gives them what's the next step. Revamping assessment can be an important part of ungrading. I had already sort of uh, directed my assessments toward the standards, which for me made it easier. I don't give multiple choice tests. I don't give tests with a particular number of questions. Neither do I do IPAs exactly. I give students texts or I provide them with, um, with spoken texts that are similar to things we've been doing, but obviously slightly different context, you know, different, uh, not just repeats of, of things that they've seen. And I ask them to tell me at what level of, um, or to show me at what level they understand it. And with speaking and with writing, I do the same. I don't, um, I don't have them write skits because I think that uh, encourages translators. And but I ask them in class, you know, write something similar to the things that we have been writing together as a class, using vocabulary that we've been using. And then I look at it and I look for the level of complexity. Are they writing, you know, basically? Memorize sentences, formulaic sentences. Are they creating new sentences with the language that they already have that they haven't been um, practicing? And then, so I'm I'm more ranking where they are in in, the, in their level of complexity. That's how assessment works for me, which is how it felt very natural to me to ungrade. All I have to do is help the student identify where on that scale or where on that progression they're falling right now and then say, now look at the next one. And for the next assessment, try that or, or do your best to, uh, to continue pushing yourself forward. If you are mandated to give a particular kind of test, I have a couple ideas. Uh, nothing that I've had been able to put into practice, but just I've tried to do a little bit of thinking because I know that that's common, but we'll get to that in a minute. Okay, feedback procedures. If I do feedback only and no scores, I have to be giving feedback. So it's not that students have no idea how they're doing. It's not that you're taking away their letter and their number and then they're just floating out in the ether and, and have no idea what's happening. It's that you're giving feedback, but you're giving feedback that means something because an A or a B or a 70 or a 84 only feels like it means something, but that is an illusion. It does not really mean anything. What means something is actual feedback. In this essay, you were using primarily formulaic language that we have practiced. Try and edit it so that you are using more um, creative sentences or something. In this assessment, you understood the main idea of, uh, of this paragraph and you were able to pick out two details. So continue to try to pay attention and take those uh, paraphrases into, um, into more main, main details or not main details, more specific details. 
So you're giving them where they are and what they can do next. Uh, for things like essays, the feedback could be, um, you're using a lot of simple sentences, try and add some more connectors, right? Or try and add some more adjectives, something to give them a next step, right? And that's going to be more useful to them than, oh, I got a nine out of 10 on this, on this essay. They don't really know what to do with that. And here's, uh, here's the part that I think is important that's probably uh, my least favorite is student reflection and doing student conferences on grades and letting students have input because giving students autonomy and giving them some control is very motivating, which is not to say that students get to just pick their grade. Although there are people who will say that, who will say, I'll let the student pick and they'll make their case and then I won't change it. That's not me. I have students that I know are tricksy and know that that's not what they earn, but they just want to push, they want to push limits. Um, so I have students reflect on, you know, this is the feedback I gave you. What do you think are your next steps? How far have you come? What grade do you think your evidence, and I use the word evidence a lot, right? Not what grade do you want, right? Because they'll all say A. What grade does your evidence reflect? And then we conference and I say, we're, we're both looking at the same evidence. We're both looking at the same um, scales, the same learning progressions. And so I either, yep, I agree. That's absolutely, all of your evidence seems to be in the same area. Seems like an A, seems like a B. Um, or, or actually, I think your evidence isn't really saying what you're saying that it does. And this is more where the evidence falls, in my opinion. This is what the letter I think that reflects and I have not yet had a student disagree with that, right? Once you point out how the evidence works. The problem with the student reflection and the conferencing is it does take time. It takes time away from using 90% target language in the class. So that's something that you either make room for or you figure out how to do outside of class. But students need practice with it because that metacognition, this idea of looking at what I'm doing and not being reliant on the teacher to tell me is very outside of most of most students' wheelhouses. They're not gonna be used to it. It's gonna make them uncomfortable. Some of them are going to say things that are evidence that are not like, I came to class on time every day. That's not evidence. Like I specifically asked you to do evidence from the scales, from the, from the feedback, and then they'll come out with, with stuff that doesn't make sense because that's how they assess their, their own learning and they need the practice. It's a hard part, but I think if you want the students to accept that the letter still can mean something, even though they haven't been getting scores, is they need to be doing the reflective piece throughout the, throughout the term um, of where they are and then getting that confirmation from you. Like, no, I, I agree. I think that's where you are so that they don't feel totally lost, right? The reflection, the conferencing, and then ultimately deciding um, together would be my uh, suggestion, deciding together what, what, what the, the ultimate grade, the letter grade will be. Because I, I do, I don't ungrade because I do have to um, give a letter at the end. I ungrade in the sense that I move as far away from grading as much as I can. Okay, common concerns. We're gonna see if we can just, I'm going to ad, uh, uh, admit that they exist and then we'll, we'll move to like question and answer kind of stuff. And then if there's a particular concern that really resonates with a, with a person, then we can talk about that more in depth. So there are logistical concerns, like my district says I have to, for example, put in three grades a week, or I have to have um, two formatives and a summative for every unit, or I have to, uh, if a district says I have to say that tests are worth 50% and homework is worth 30% and blah, blah, blah is worth something else. Those are logistical, very legitimate concerns. Common exams is another concern. How do you revamp your exams if you don't control your exams? If you as a district or you as a uh, department have exams and they're all multiple choice and they're all discrete, what do you do about that? I don't have time to give individual feedback is another concern. The idea that typing numbers into a spreadsheet or into a grade book is, a lot faster than typing out sentences or, or doing conferences. That's a legitimate concern that, you know, I have some ideas about as well. And then there's the ethical concerns. 
I've already talked earlier about how a lot of these grading is very intimately held. As much as we think it is objective, it is very much a reflection of our principles. And when we feel like when we feel like we're going to do students an ethical disservice by taking away the carrots and sticks that we've been using to make them do what we think are ethical things, that feels that feels very threatening. So they won't do the work. I mean, probably the most common concern. If you don't give it points, they won't do the work. If there's no X, then students will learn. And by learn, I mean take away, as in like they will in they will internalize. If there's no late penalty, students will internalize that punctuality isn't important. If there's no zero, students will learn that they don't have to turn in work. If there's no um, I can't, uh, there's a bunch of those, but there's two examples. And how will I encourage students to blank? How will I encourage students to participate? How will I encourage students to listen? How will I encourage students to do extra stuff outside of class, right? We want our students to do things. We know what is better and uh, appropriate for their language acquisition. How do we get them to do it if we don't give it points? So those are all sorts of questions and it is, two o'clock on the dot, according to my clock. So now I'm gonna open it up. Whatever the, those questions resonates or any others, I've been talking a lot. Thank you so much, um, Lake. There's been uh, quite a bit of uh, chatting um, and some really, really interesting question. I'm gonna start um, oh, instead Lawrence, of starting yeah, with the you. earliest one. I'm gonna start with the latest one. Can you hear me? Lake? Lake, can you hear me? Uh, I see your lips moving. No, you cannot hear me. <laughs> it's not just me being confusingly muted. Do you have your headphones set up differently than your microphone? And maybe? while Florencia figures out. Uh, yeah, I had to go in my settings and like, changed my my microphone it had switched it automatically so i don't know if that might okay work for can you you, you can hear me now a list of resources that i can it's just a bunch of, of the, the authors and and books and a couple facebook groups if anyone is hasn't read and wants to know more things that, that i've been reading that i've found very um impactful i don't know if you can hear me or no, not like still can't hear no. you okay Yeah, I oh, know strange. we can hear her. I think it's just the way she has her own, um, only the headphones connected, but she's not, <laughs> she doesn't have the headphones on. Um, it's probably directing her sound somewhere else. I can I can hear you. It did it to me again. I don't know. It just changed my speaker. It did. Yeah, it, okay. I went and I changed my settings. Apparently it was me. Sorry right. about that. No, no, no. It's all good. It's all good. It, it all worked out. So I'm going to start with a, with a, most recent or latest um, question. So one question was, how do you communicate um, students' performance in the class to students and to parents? What oh. do you do for mid-quarter grades, end of quarter grades, et cetera? Yeah, um, that has been a trial and error. So when I first started, I got permission from my admin and I said, I'm just not going to do grades, I'm just gonna give feedback. And he was like, oh, that's that's actually closer to what we're hoping our district will eventually move towards. So you're, you're free to do that. And then he completely forgot that conversation and reached out to me and said, why why are all of your students failing? <laughs> because I they all said no count, like their grades all said no count. And I said, they're not, They um, I don't have any grades in the grade book. And then he remembered. And um, so then because of that, I have, adjusted my expectations to say I'm not I can't wait until the very end of the semester to give them a letter grade uh, after each period of assessment you know when we go through a set of evaluations of, of, of different skills then we'll put in like a placeholder so when I said like um, that I don't wait and I don't average that placeholder says this is if this were the grade right now this is where your evidence is sitting right along that proficiency scale or along that learning progression 
and and then that will be replaced with the next set and replaced. And then at the end of the semester, we have our final conference. And um, and so what I did with parents was I communicated to them, and I still have items in the grade book. They're just they don't count for anything. Like they're all no count, so they don't contribute to the grade. But I keep evidence so parents can see, you know, student did this much Duolingo and whether or not the student completed the assessment, I'll, the only thing that I'll say in the, in the grade book is whether it was done or whether it's missing. But I tell the parents that, I, um, that I'm providing students with feedback and if they have questions, they should go to their students and they should open up that feedback and then the student can explain to them. And honestly, that's better, right? We want the students to be able to understand and communicate how they're doing. Uh, to any of the stakeholders, to themselves, to us, and to uh, their parents. So what I did, I think that there are a number of different feedback um, solutions that are being developed, none of which I have tried because I don't have the budget um, to do any of those things. There's something called Got Learning. Um, there's at least one other that, that, whose name escapes me at the moment. But what I did was I created a spreadsheet. And the spreadsheet is all of the feedback for the entire semester. So it has the date, it has the skill, which you could do interpersonal, presentational, or whatever. I do reading, listening, speaking, writing. Uh, it has like a title. So how would I describe this in a couple words so that I can remember which assessment it was? You could do units um, or whatever else helps you keep track. And then I have a column, I added a column for reflection because I wanted the students to not exactly predict how they did, but I wanted them to reflect on this is how I feel that I did before I've gotten any feedback. So I think that I did this because I, I want to know how accurately they're self-assessing before I give them feedback. And then there's a column for my feedback. And then uh, in class, they have a couple minutes to, to look over those things. And then I encourage them to reach out to me if they feel like their self-assessment and my feedback were super far apart. And if it wasn't, then I just want them to think, you know, what's my next step? What is, what do I need to continue to do to grow? So that's how that's how I've been giving, um, giving them their feedback. And it's not a perfect system. It means that I have two spreadsheets. I have, uh, I have the spreadsheet where I keep all of my comments so that students can't like delete things. And then each student has their own spreadsheet. We do this through Google Classroom. So each student has the spreadsheet that's just their work, and then I copy and paste. So. Not the, not the worst, but also not perfect. And I'd love to hear anybody else's uh, suggestion for how to make that more efficient. But that's the, that's the system that occurred to me with the tools that I have at my disposal at the moment, which is basically Google Suite. All right, thank you. Um, another question related to that one was about pushback. Have you gotten pushback from parents or even from students? I mean, in higher ed, we are not going to get pushback from parents necessarily, although we all have our unique stories. But, yeah, but definitely, you. we might have pushback from students who are being graded traditionally in other courses and who <laughs> cannot let go of that. No, I need to be calculating my points and my percentage. So have you gotten anything like that? And what did you do? So I waited a little while. I didn't reach out to parents for the first month or two of class. And I probably should have done it earlier. I just wasn't sure exactly. I had a, like a draft email um, that I kept editing. And eventually I said like, it's been long enough. They need, the, the parents should know that when they go into, into their um, the online grade book or whatever and can see their students' progress that they should know what it is that they're seeing. So I sent them an email. And uh, basically, I, I didn't call it ungrading. I said, I'm piloting a new approach to grading where I want students to think about how they're doing and not what they're getting. I basically framed it similar to, uh, to some of the things that I, I said earlier. And I said, I will give them feedback. And I told them where to find the feedback. I will not give them scores. I told them what the grade book would look like, that it would... Um, that it would say whether uh, an assignment was missing, but that it wouldn't give a score, that if they wanted to know that, then, then that part of my goal for their student was that they could uh, explain their own progress. And so that directing them to have that conversation with the student, but that if they had any questions, they could contact me. And I had one response uh, 
part of that might be my student population that and also being you know being an elective and not being you know physics or ap calculus or something that it didn't feel as high as high stakes maybe for a spanish class as an elective so i didn't i have not yet experienced a lot of parent pushback i got one response and that response was excited was like wow this sounds really cool and sounds like it's great for learning um and so that was a relief that that i didn't uh didn't make anyone mad i'm sure that it it can and will happen at some point um but i'm gonna go back to the fact that i cleared this with with uh, my administration and that my ultimate goal is what's best for the students if the parents are concerned chances are it's fear that it's fear that they don't know how their student is doing and i can ass assuage that fear by saying okay then let's look at their evidence and and let's talk it out and talk it out with them come in for a conference uh, outside of the regular um conference time if they want to for a student that's that's concerned like at the higher ed level and we're hoping we're not hearing from their parents then come in during office hours if you really feel like you're like you're confused about what the feedback means then let's Let's have that opportunity to talk, right? So on that note, um, there was a request earlier on in the in the webinar, which I'm not sure if perhaps that was already addressed with the rest of your webinar. But if you can um, give us a more clear idea of what you mean by feedback, what kind of feedback are you giving? Is it like feedback on performance, on their language, on it, what does this feedback look like? Yeah, I think. The feedback is going to depend on what your goals are for the student right when I have so since i've been i'm currently working on and uh, developing my learning progressions with. The authors of going gradeless I just had a meeting earlier with um, with one of them and just to kind of once. It's easier to give feedback if you know what the goal is right, so if your goal is students should be able to. Um, use current vocabulary to create novel sentences. I don't use the word novel in the we're learning progression because that's actual language. They're not going to understand what that means. They're going to think it's talking about a book uh, to create new sentences. Um, and then, you know, they write an essay and I see that that's the case. Then my feedback is going to be, this is what you're doing. Um, also having spent a lot of the summer reading Alfie Cohn and talking about the difference between, you know, kind of feedback that describes and feedback that praises or criticizes, trying to avoid those other two, like not even saying, oh, this is so great, because what a great essay. What is that? What, what do they know? Like, what do they know what they did and what their next steps are? Or this was really weak, or this was really vague. Well, how was it weak? And in what sense was it vague? So trying to be as descriptive in the feedback as possible, this is what I saw you do. You wrote this many sentences, you use this many different verbs and you don't have to be this nitty gritty about it. I've gone back and forth. Uh, it depends on what you're asking the students to do. Um, you, and to be able to say, you know, this is what you're doing right now. Your next step would be try and diversify your verbs, try and add some more adjectives. Right now your sentences are following the same. They're only three to five words, they're super short. Let's add some connectors, right? So, so giving, giving a specific feedback on what they can do next to make their work stronger. Okay, thank you. Um, a quick request based on what you just said. Can you share a copy or a version of that email that you sent to parents? Yes, I can. And okay. I meant, to, I meant to pull that up and then I forgot. So it might take me a second. Um, and the email was not perfect. I would probably make some changes to it now, but it was it, what it's a starting it's a starting point. It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> Let's see, I have to, because I sent it through the grade book. Um, let's see. And some of this won't, uh, won't be relevant because you know you won't use Skyward or things like that, but I can paste it into the right. chat. It'll be a little long. I am, as you okay. may have noticed, I have a tendency to uh, over explain things. <laughs> I I am a verbose <laughs> You're person. Fine. You are fine. So uh, so I.
Oh, we lost your sound again. Yeah, we lost your sound again, Lake. Issue is that she cannot hear me and um, she's not looking at Zoom. So unfortunately, there's no way for me to alert her. I'm sorry, everyone. I don't know why she her audio settings keep changing. I don't think she can. Um, And my audio, my computer did that thing again. So sorry. Okay, hey, now now I came back on. Now I came yeah. back on. Okay. I don't know. I don't even know how long it's been like that. Let's see if I can get it to for a little while, but it's okay. Now we can see the email. Were you yep. explaining something about the email? We missed that. Uh yeah. I was kind of just pointing out a couple a uh, couple things about um about the email. Okay. Yeah, okay, well, drawing. thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for, for sharing that so generously. Um, yeah, with well, us. We'll, we'll figure out some other way I can, I can um, get that. And it's not a perfect email, but it's something. Yes, no, no, no. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there were a lot of other questions. I'm sorry if I missed some of them are just general questions like um, we should have a presentation like this for higher ed. I appreciate the suggestions and we'll make it happen. I promise. Uh, there's also some requests about where we can find a, maybe a list of resources such as the books you keep mentioning or maybe podcasts or maybe blog posts. Is there any, do you have any do you have them compiled already or do you have any recommendations of where we can find a list of resources? Sources about ungrading. Oops. So here are the books that I have read and the classes that I have joined. Let me see if I can get it to paste. This will paste into the chat. Boom. There we got that. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah. And then I'll put the email in case people were still reading that. Yeah. So I started out with grading for equity, then moved to ungrading. There, ungrading is interesting because there are so many different ways to ungrade. This is the way that just made sense to me. Um, there's also contract grading, which is saying like, I'm going to do yes. X, Y, and Z for a particular grade. To me, that feels very strange for language acquisition because I want students to be interacting with everything that they can. Um, but I'm sure there's a way to make it work. Um, for We've had a webinar, yeah. We've had a webinar on contract learning. Um, our ESL program uses it for oh, okay. uh, upper level composition courses. And it's, it's really interesting. It's just I'm, another take on it. Uh, that I yes, really interesting for, too. For a, for a composition course, I can understand it because that feel that's that's basically English. It's I mean, you know what I mean? Like uh, language arts. It's basically language arts 
uh, for language acquisition, it feels strange. I, I couldn't wrap my head around, around how to make that work. But if you're doing like a, a content course in literature or in composition or in linguistics right. or whatever, that I could see working easily. So related to that, since you brought up language acquisition, there was a question at the very beginning saying, what, group, um, what categories uh, do you have in your grade book? So do you do the three modes? Uh, how do you organize it? And you said you still have to give a grade. So what does your grade book look like in terms of do you do percentages like we do? Or how, how, do, you, how do you make it work? Yeah, so I have to give a letter grade at the end of the semester. Uh, because I, they need something for their report card. We don't do like a mastery transcript or a standards-based report card where you're basically saying, you know, this is how you're doing on individual standards. It all has to, it still in the end has to be summed up by one particular letter, which um, is sad, but that's what, that, those are the constraints of the system that we're in. I choose to do reading, listening, speaking, writing, and culture. Uh, I don't choose to do Actuals 3 modes because it feels like it overemphasizes production to me because interpretive is reading and listening and presentational is speaking and writing. But really when we grade interpersonal, we're grading more so the, pres more so the presentational parts of it. So it feels like it overemphasizes, at least that's the way it feels to me, um, the presentational part. And I want... I want the skills to be more evenly graded. And honestly, if a student wanted to advocate to me, I did really well in listening and reading. And you said that those are the most important parts of Spanish one. And I didn't do as well in speaking and writing. And I don't feel it's fair for my grade to suffer for that. And they want to advocate for themselves in that way. That's a conversation I would listen to. Um, I don't currently have it weighted in any particular way. What I did for them was um, basically said, you know, this is the target. This is where I think it is reasonable for any student to be given a, you know, a reasonable amount of effort. Um, that's a B to me. And I know that Florency, you have uh, like some discussion about whether exceed, whether meeting a target is an A or a B. And so to me, rather than, rather than saying there's no exceeds, I just, I make the target as reasonable as I think it can be. I don't want to say I lower it, but I make it very, very reasonable. And then, so it's actually very possible for students to exceed it and then they feel good. Um, so uh, meeting across the board to me would be a B. When you start exceeding, then that's like B plus. It depends on whether your, your district or your department does plus and minus grades. Um, and then if you're exceeding more of them than you're meeting, then that's the A minus. If you're meeting almost all of them or all of them, then that's to me, or if you're exceed, yeah, right? Did I say that right? Exceeding in most or all, then that to me is an A. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I think every single one of them is an equal distribution. I just put it out there and I'm, I am unburdening myself from the percentages of saying that it has to be, <laughs> that it has to be equal 25, 25, 25, or 20, 20, 20, 20, if I, uh, if I count culture as part of my grade two. Okay, thank you. Um, there was uh, quite a bit of interest in seeing your observations, or if you have data, we want to see the data. Uh, have you seen any improvement in student proficiency that you could potentially link to switching to ungrading? Or have you seen any difference in retention? So students who perhaps feel more motivated to continue with Spanish and whether you think it was due to changing your um, grading practices? So I only have a limited, you know, as I'm working towards this, I'm still at the beginning kind of part of my journey and my, my evolution into this. Um, do I think it's affecting student proficiency? I'm still teaching the same way that I'm teaching. So I don't, so I will candidly admit that I don't know that I think it's impacting proficiency, but I do think it's impacting student confidence and student attention, right? That's my ultimate goal with ungrading is I still teach the way I teach. I teach for proficiency. I teach communicatively. I teach with comprehensible input. None of that is changing. Um, so I don't know that I think 
that it um, that that taking away the grades is necessarily making that in, that interaction in class any different. But I do think that the students who would be very demotivated by poor grades, but the students that are kind of in class either because they have to, which isn't the case in my district, there's no requirement, but some districts do have that or the students who are taking the as an elective because it was the worst, it was the best of all of the options for electives that fit in their schedule. And so they're taking it kind of not wanting to be there. I think it allows them to be brought along uh, in less mm, intimidating a way. As far as retention goes, that's still, that's, some, that's an issue I am struggling with in my particular school. And I'm hopeful that if we're, you know, word gets around that this class, I don't want to say it's easy, but it, uh, but it should be very welcoming and it should be very approachable. I'm hope, I'm hoping to see more of a, of a turnaround as word gets around about that. Thank you. Um, another question was, do you feel you have to have or keep a record of evidence to have proof of how you assess every student? Uh, potentially anticipating um, the issue of students comparing themselves or comparing their own grade with another student's grades um, and then feeling like there's um, any kind of unfairness going on or they, they, they don't see why the grades are different. Sure. And I, so I keep a record of all of the feedback that I give. And like I said, I try to make the feedback very descriptive. So the students can't really compare amongst themselves and say, well, it's not fair. You're being nicer to the student when the feedback is literally like you have five sentences and that you use three different verbs and you use two adjectives or you use two different time periods, right? Right. When it's descriptive and it's going back to the, to the proficiency scales or what I'll be doing in the future is learning progressions. Um, I feel like that part is pretty objective. And as long as the feedback lines up with the scales, then they should understand. Um, they do still, you know, try to compare, oh, well, you know, I got, I got a meeting expectations. Did you get meeting expectations or did you get exceeding? Like they're always going to do those things that, uh, where they're focusing, where they're again, not focusing on their learning. So it's always something of a compromise but whatever I can do to pull them away as much as I can is what I'm gonna try to do. Thank you. There was a question more specific to higher ed, but it's something that I wonder as well, and I don't know if you've experienced any degree of it, um, which is the fact that some students are not motivated to be in the course. Uh, they may not be motivated to do the work, I don't know how much that resonates with you or not, but it is an issue in higher ed, right? That the students come and they do things only when it's worth enough points, right? When, and, and this is why we get into the cycle of grades as a way to enforce compliance, right? Um, yes. The issue, the other issue we have in higher ed is also the students who, if there's no necessarily no points, there's just feedbacks, no scores. They don't do anything until only the part that is a score, they do poorly, and then they blame the instructor on not teaching them, right? It just, it becomes more of a headache, you know? So yeah. what is, what have you done? Have you experienced any of that, that the students who are not motivated, it is, it's hard to, to kind of motivate them to see the value in feedback only, or have you seen the opposite? Or maybe the students are not motivated, but it wasn't scores that was going to motivate them anyway. So yeah. have you experienced any of that with particularly unmotivated students? Yeah, I have. I, I do not live in, or I do not teach in an area. I don't live in an area either, but I do not teach in an area where students are particularly motivated to take languages, hence the uh, retention issues. Um, but what I would say is that the more that I, the more that I interact with my students, and the more that I um, that I do this ungrading work and have conversations with them, the more I realize that, uh, as I said earlier, the more points isn't the solution because the points are the problem. So it's the fact that we give things points at all that, hold on just a second. It's the fact that we give points, sorry, my daughter was starting to come through the door. It's the fact that we give points at all that makes things that don't have points seem pointless, seem unvaluable. 
So it's the fact that we say, well, tests are important because they have points that make things that have less points like assignments seem like, oh, why would I bother doing that? Because I, the test is worth more. I honestly think it, um, and one thing that I will tell my students, because I do at the beginning of, of the semester last year, I did have students say like, you know, is this going in the grade book still? And so I would say it doesn't have points, but it's still evidence because I do. I track what they do during class. And if they're, those assignments are going into the grade book, I'm just not giving them points. And all of that is evidence for the final conference, right? All of that is something that I can point to and say, this is how you're showing me what you can do. And if you're not gonna show me anything, then the best I can give you is an incomplete, right? And I don't think students want that either. So so finding the way to, to, to I don't know, have idealistic and candid conversations with them about how you're here for their learning. Like, I don't, I don't know, maybe people are gonna laugh and say like, ha ha ha, that's not gonna work with the students that are being forced to take Spanish. But I think giving them points and trying to focus in more on the points is more likely to be the demotivational factor, right? I think if we take that away, then we open up more space for, I'm here because I want you to learn. And not just because I want to punish you for not doing what I'm asking you to do. Yes, I agree. And and sometimes we anticipate it's not going to work, and then we don't even try it. Yeah, well, that's when we say. try it. In baby steps, I really like how you you did the baby steps and the medium steps. I mean, even for me to say, okay, we're going to do you know attendance optional. There's no participation points. You come to class if you want to learn. For me, maybe for everybody's like a baby step, but for me it was like a Okay, let's see how this goes. Is anybody going to come to class? You know, you just you keep wondering it. And yes, they did come to class. And so sometimes you got to try it before you immediately conclude, oh, it's not going to work. And, you know, so but yes. but I do understand. Definitely. I understand the concerns very much. Yes. Um, okay, before we go, there's a request for can we see your learning progression? Yeah, they are under they are under development. <laughs> and um, I mean, it makes me nervous. Uh, <laughs> okay, no, no, no. If you don't want to well, share, I, I no problem yeah, at all. Long, so I don't know how much a person could really um, could really absorb from them. But here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be brave. I'm gonna take a leap of faith. I'm gonna share the tab where I have been working on them. So these are some things. Okay, we see it. We I'm see it. So I'm using actual language, not because I I don't love those those labels, because I think it. It gives it a little bit more officialness than I really want to um, than I really want to project. But you know, so novice low, identifying words, novice mid, paraphrasing main ideas, novice high, translating specific details. And so then this would go across multiple different levels, right? I would expect that Spanish one would be in that novice range. Spanish two would be bridging between novice and intermediate. Spanish three is moving more into the intermediate, et cetera. So wherever they are they can you know, see what is the next step. What is their evidence gonna to need to look like before, before they'd be at that next step? All right, thank you so much. There were a lot of uh, wonderful questions in the chat. I'm sorry, we could not address all of them. Um, Lake, do you want to share any way that people can stay in touch with you or follow you on social media or anything like that? If you want, if not, <laughs> We respect privacy, not a problem at all. Uh, but I think it was just very thought provoking and we want to keep learning. And I personally really appreciate a fellow language teacher sharing her, um, her experiences because sometimes a lot of what you read, as you mentioned, sometimes comes from the sciences. Mm -hmm. And then we feel like, how applicable is this to me? Uh, yeah. So we really, really appreciate you sharing that. And I'm sure that you have inspired a lot of people to take some baby steps <laughs> or medium so, steps. Why not? Yeah. Yes. So here before I'll, I'll quickly. So I have multiple email addresses, obviously. My Gmail is the one that will be the most permanent, right? If I were ever to switch schools. Otherwise, I am still on Twitter because it still exists as long as that happens. So that's I'm just really easy to find on Twitter. Otherwise, uh, contact me through Facebook. I, I spend a lot of time talking and interacting with uh, different language groups on Facebook. I am happy to. I Can we? I don't think it's down. pasting anything in the chat. So if you oh, put, I don't go. know if you put it in the chat. Oh, you're displaying it in now. The there we go. Now we can in see it. Chat. So yes. Yeah, so either email or Twitter. Here we go. Yeah. 
Thank you so, so much. And thank you, everybody, for, for attending and for your wonderful questions. I'm so sorry we could not get to all of them. But um, thank you very, very much for being here um, and participating. And thank you once again, Lake. Have a great afternoon, everybody.